changed. I used to be visiting, I think, visiting things down there, visiting. Blocks. years you kind of forget. Sell now. It was just down here from what? I'd say this was my first shell. It used to be covered along here and then your bed. And there was another cupboard here. first came in, I'd have been here with um, Marion Clegg and Jennifer McCann. And there was only three of us for a while on the man. And then Mary McCulgan came in. And we used to be, as I say, this was my cell. <coughs> Marion's would have been next door. Jennifer's was next to that. Mary's would have been next to that. And our social, as we called it, was down here at the bottom of the wing. We would go and watch the television. And the girls were in protest, dirty protests in A Wing at that time. So they weren't allowed anything. Uh, food parcels or cigarettes or anything. So usually on a Saturday night, we would be watching the telly, we'd sit here, and it was always two or four hundred cigarettes to be opened and broke up and tobacco took out and put into a plastic bag to be able to smuggle it over to the girls and they at mass on a Sunday. We were done that on a Saturday night. And some of the bags were quite bulky. Walking, you just have to practice walking up and down here. What we did. But Again, that was that. Kitchen area was up there somewhere. And there was a, the gate was locked and the stairs we weren't allowed down to associate with the rest of the, the prisoners in this wing until you were sentenced. But because I was pregnant when I came in, I spent the first seven months up here and then was sent down to the bottom wing for safety reasons. As they say, which is on down here. Toilets. This has changed. I think um, one of the Price sisters moved into this down to these couple of cells after Kevin had went home, and they changed this whole area for, I think it was Dolores, no, Marion. And it was all blocked off. When I left, it was all blocked off. So they changed here. Yeah, that would have been my cell. At the minute, it says, obviously, it was turned into a kitchen at that stage. But Kevin would have been with me in, when they use this cell for, they're all the same. It's quite dark in there, mind you, but, um, I would have had, again, the furniture in it, the wardrobe and the wee top 
sit down and write your letter. And another cupboard behind the door. And my bed might have run along the top of the radiator and Kevin's cot would have come down this way. But I'd have brought Kevin back to the cell or the one next door. Um, Kevin didn't lost out as far as love and affection was concerned. There was plenty here to give up. He was the only baby in the wing. And at night when we'd go in to lock up, I'd sit and play with him and uh, you know, we infectious, infectious giggle, which could be heard all over the wing. The echo, the whole wing in the prison. Um, never short of babysitters. <laughs> You're going to have a bath or do something or just want it now or on your own. Any of the girls would have, would have took Kevin. He was fighting over Kevin as to who wanted to play with him and whatever else. And the day that Kevin was going out of here was very hard on not just himself, but every girl, every girl in here at that time. And I came out of that cell to walk down to go to the visiting room to hand Kevin over. Could have been, I'd say maybe. 10, 15 girls on each side of this from here on down and every one of them was crying and saying their goodbyes to him. I was actually trying to cheer them up, <laughs> I remember. After Kevin had went out, I was then moved up stairs to B2 and that's where I ended up, that's where I'd done the last year or so uh, from sentence. After he went out, I didn't mix very well. I liked to sit in my cell and lock the door a lot. I didn't really want company of any description. The night he went out, I shared the cell with the girl, Lorraine helped me. She was doing life. And we sat and talked. I think I poured my heart out that night to end up she cried instead of me. Um, memories of the girls. There's definitely memories of the girls. That is. Three years, I don't know how <laughs> managed to do it, but like everything else, she, she had to do it. And you did. I'd have been in this cell. It'd be true. That's the toilet. It's this one. <laughs> yeah, it would have been this one. There was a wee woman who used to come in every Christmas. We, she was a wee bag lady. I think it was a wee Maggie, was her name. But she used to come in here every. used to take her off the streets at Christmas for somewhere for her to go. And uh, she used to open the window and feed the pigeons. And you'd come in most days and the place would be full of pigeons. She had them in the cell and everything else. So this is where I, she'd obviously left and I moved in here. I used to have a fight with the pigeons at the window. Because of Maggie. More so than anything else. But um, again there was furniture along this wall. Bed along there. Furniture over there. And would have spent a lot of time in the cell. More so than any of the rest of them. Ken went out and kind of come back up in the evening or whatever and just get the screws to lock the door for a long time after he went out. Wouldn't mix with anybody, didn't want to mix with anybody. It wasn't the girls or anybody's fault, it was just the way I dealt with that at that time. I did. And then the chapel, which we, when we were in remand, we went to most Sundays. But again, it was only for handing stuff over to the girls on protest on A-Wing. We'd come in this door and the girls would come in here. And 
must have been pregnant, a bit woozy in the mornings. The smell coming from me wing at times it was Tara, like, you know, the girls were in dirty protest. It wasn't their fault. It was. But you kind of had to brace yourself for that initial smell coming off the wing, you know, while well, you did. But it was okay. It was. Again, it was just handing over tobacco and letters and stuff that you had to smuggle over to, to the girls over there. It was after that. They used to, I think, used to have a cinnamon here too. But never come up, never come to watch a film or anything in it. Father Murray used to be here. I'm going to peep in here at Ewing because it's a. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen it. I don't, I'm sure it's no different than the other wing. At the end of the day, I think colour is different. This is different. I've never been in this part of the thing, prison before. I haven't. It was, you were kept to your own wing, and that was it. I was usually was curious as to what what it looked like. More floorboards in here than there is on the other side. Isn't there? Which I don't know whether it'd been there originally or not. I don't. I see the girls over here now wouldn't have had a a good time of it at all. Quite a few that were about when you would have when Marion, mind you, Marion came on, I think she came on dirty protest too. And then Marion was diagnosed with having TB. So she spent a lot of time locked in her cell because they didn't know whether it was contagious for a while or what. She wouldn't have been very, very well. <laughs> Basically because you knew the girls in this wing had a lot harder time than the girls in B wing. I don't remember crossing a yard to get to the hospital wing. Do you know what I mean? But then you spend 25 years trying to forget about it. I suppose it kind of does go blurry on you, but... At the end of the day, like, you, you're still visiting your head all the... Most days you'll visit, you'll think about it, or... And I don't remember... <coughs> I don't even remember the, the yard being this shape. <laughs> I don't know. Not that I would have come out to the yard very much, really. I wouldn't. somewhere. <laughs> I did. Yeah, this would have been what I would have used when I was in this this cell downstairs. Like Evan, this was my um I knew the sinks, knew there had to be sink somewhere. Well I did. But at the time I was downstairs there was nobody else with 
you know, I was segregated then from the rest of them because I was supposed to be up on the third floor and I went down here, which meant <coughs> you weren't supposed to actually associate with the rest of the, the um, sentence prisoners. At that time, I can't even remember why, but they didn't have to associate with you, basically, if they didn't want to. And is that the social, they used to call it for TV room? It was on down a bit. I think that was the TV room at one stage. This one's no, next one, I don't even remember them being down here. No, I don't. Kitchen. Remember a kitchen? And then here. And then they used to have the thing here and serve your dinner and whatever. And there used to be a pool table there. Well, the first night I came in, the gates opened. The first thing to stare at me was a pram. And I remember thinking, what the fuck is a pram doing? And I kept like this, not realising that you are, actually could have babies here and keep them for a while or anything like that. And um, I spent the, most of my pregnancy, I think I was a couple of weeks pregnant when I came in. And being 19, you thought, well, I'll nobody's going to be pregnant. <laughs> None of your mates. That uh, stupid way of looking at it, like, but being 19 years of age, that was, but um, like that Kevin used to have a wee kind of a walkie, you know, a wee thing that kids run about in, he used to have the hole up of the, the bottom part of there, so he did, and as I say, plenty of women to, to look after him and play with him. He was a happy and quiet child, thanks for God. And I had one of the other prisoners sharing the wing with me, or sharing the cell with me at the time, Marion Clegg. And uh, I remember I was sitting and writing letters the same night, night and they get in the cell and talking and whatever. And I kept getting niggly pains at the bottom of my back. Which at the time I probably didn't even realise it was in labour. But as we were about to lie down for the night, and I said it to Marion, I have any pains at the bottom of my back, Marion, I don't know, is there anything? Blah, blah, blah. blah. So she started watching and then pressed the buzzer, three o'clock, three o'clock at night in the morning. And uh, the screws come in. Is there a nurse? One of the nurses came in as well. Can't remember her name. But she came in anyway and the screws and the ambulance was called and was took down through reception. Took an ambulance to Craig Avon Hospital. Uh, one of the screws here at the time used to say, don't you dare go into labour when I'm on. She was only young herself. And change over the next morning would have been about, I suppose, eight o'clock, I'm not sure. And the one that was changed over to her was, she was the one that walked in. She thought I'd had the child and all that stage, but I hadn't. And we kind of started in rough labour. So she was there for the whole lot. So she was, uh, he was born at... 12.48, I think it was a Wednesday, on the 1st of July, and we were back here within the 24 hours, but when he was, it was hard enough to have, it was forceps delivery and stitches, whatever, I found it very hard to walk, but when I come back here, I know I had to walk through the reception, up the steps were after coming up and through into the circle, and walk up into the hospital wing. Which was very hard at the time because I've never had stitches before <laughs> down below. You don't know what it's like yourself. Um, we're over there. Uh, Kevin was a great sleeper from day one. He went down that evening, I think I fed him about half six. I remember the screws saying, like, we'll leave the door open if the night if you want anybody in to feed him if he wakes up for you or is cranky or whatever. But he didn't. I think it was half eleven the next morning, we were kind of prodding him awake. So it was so. Um, I got up and had the bath and whatever else and back into the cell. And that was it, they, they locked the door then from that first night on, it was locked after that. So it was, nothing had to do, I done it. 
myself. Like that, having Kevin in here, like um, you had a special permission for things like it for christenings and stuff. And Father Murray always insisted on having his name in among the child's name anyway. Doesn't matter who had a child, it was always you had to put Raymond in there somewhere. So Kevin's Kevin Jared Raymond. Raymond went after Father Murray. Um, you had to ask permission, special permission, to have your child christened in the so called chapel. Here. And uh, it's something I just didn't want to do. I didn't consider it a chapel for a start off, but I wasn't asking permission for, for that to happen. So um, between Mr. Rafferty, who was a social worker, and used to take Kevin out and walks here for me because I wanted him to be used to cars and stuff and shops and other people, apart from anything else, normal run of things. So I'd arranged my heart on the Saturday to collect Kevin here. Father Murray was waiting over at the chapel. And my father and my aunt and my brother come up. My aunt and my brother were standing for Kevin. And Mr. Rafty took him out as normal in his ordinary clothes. They had the christening robe up with them. Didn't want anybody, I knew the girls knew, but didn't want anybody else to know what was going down as such. And that was none of their business, nothing to do with them. So it left. Mr. Rafty took him out and uh, had him christened St Malachy's, I think it's the name of the chapel here, and brought him back. The only downfall when she came back was the fact that the pool table was there, in the middle of there, just up before you go up the stairs. And I was up in my cell at the far end, and I remember hearing all this commotion. I was sitting waiting for him to come back, and hearing this commotion, and she'd actually brought him in and lay him on the pool table for everybody to see, before I'd seen him, I remember that type of thing would get to me, as in, I wasn't going to be at his christening, but I wanted to be the first one in here, as such, to see him in his christening robe. But she had already laid him out on the table, on the pool table. I remember being not too happy that day, or that type of thing. Um, I say Kevin was very easy going, very quiet, um, a very close bond. Very seldom I'd cried in here or anything like that, but the day that the governor called me over to say that you wanted Kevin out that September, it was my 21st birthday, 17th of May. The girls, of course, had set up cards and cakes and not much you can do in here, like, but they'd done a wee bit of a party thing. <laughs> and my cell was covered in uh, cards and stuff. And I remember coming back and wiping them all to the floor and breaking down and crying because of the conversation was after having the murder of the governor. And Kevin was asleep in his cot. And I remember when I cried, he cried. He didn't waken, he just cried. When I stopped, he stopped. So we always had a close bond that way. And thanks be to God, it's never ever been broke. That hasn't. Um, someday I, I want him to see this himself, but it wasn't all doom and gloom. I mean, Kevin brought a lot of crack to the girls, like everybody who doesn't enjoy a baby. And there was 20 odd girls in there that at some stage that he always come down to speak to him and act the and talk and play and whatever. I think he could talk before he could walk. There's that many people talking to him. Well, there was, but um, as I say, the day he went out was very hard 
on, not just me, but the rest of the girls. And come back up to the wing, because by the time I went and we visit to hand him over, I come back up onto the wing again. The cell that I had been in and left to go down on my visit was completely cleaned out by the girls. Everything in it was took out of it, caught. Anything to do with Kevin or myself, my clothes were took up onto B2 to the cell I was going to go into. So they had come, they had moved all up so I didn't have to go back into that cell after he left. But again, uh, on the day itself, you're coming back, you were, there was girls were crying all over the place, like, and, and you're trying to kind of think, oh, not that bad, don't worry about it, we'll be up next week in the visit, and blah, blah, blah. But I would have to say that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do, was to hand him over to, and it, to, to my father, or he was going home to my family, like, but it was like, when you walk back up that wing, it was as if he was dead. You just felt... You know, and as I say, the bond, thanks for God, the bond has never, never been broke, but I thought it would have been at the time. And then you got to remember there was a lot of girls in there that had babies and kids and stuff at home, and they were feeling every bit as bad as me, you know, some, some of them even worse probably, you know. I remember a girl coming in one time after that. I well, should have been in when Kevin was here, but not for too long. She was pregnant. I not mention her name because at the time she wanted everyone kept a secret, so. But she'd come in pregnant and there was only two or three of her mates that knew she was pregnant when she was here. And like that, she'd have carried her baby. And in her first couple of weeks, she said this baby was going to be adopted. She couldn't tell her family. Family think were very holy or whatever. And wouldn't tell them. So she stuck her visits and might only be once every three months. And it was to the two or three people that knew she was pregnant. And I remember her having was a wee girl at the time. And uh, same thing as myself, she'd have been took to Greg Avon. She had the baby and she was took back without the baby because she was putting the baby up for adoption. At the time, uh, the time that was going on, I thought she was kind of hard, but getting to know her better. She thought she was going down for a long stretch. She didn't want anybody to know she was pregnant. Didn't want her family definitely not to know. And about four months later, she went to trial and her case was through out of court. And I often wonder about her. I often wonder how she managed to live with that because it broke her heart, like at the end of the day. You thought she was hard, she wasn't hard. It was something she felt she had to do. She thought she was gonna be in here for a long, long time and had nobody to send her baby to as she thought. So she ended up having it adopted. And I've often wondered. We never seen her after that. She went out here one day to go to court and never come back. But admitted to it before she left, if, if she had, of, you know, in her eyes, she was going to do a long time. But she'd have loved to have kept her baby. But because she thought she was going to be in here for years, she ended up having to give up her adoption. So. There's always one bit worse off than yourself at the end of the day. That's the only way to look at it. I kept mine, could keep mine, had family support and everything else. She felt she couldn't. I think that's a lot sadder than my story, really. At the end of the day, no doubt. I've often wondered about her. And she wasn't a very stable person at the time. She was very um, nervous and she wouldn't have been very well either. Just wondered from she went out. I've never heard tell of her since. Did she... Um, over it. I don't think she ever would. I don't. That's one big memory. That... Mm. months after he was born I was running up and down to reception with people leaving stuff in. No any girl in here. I think nearly every relation I had must have sent something for him, you know, clothes and 
blankets and you name it. I could have opened a boutique <laughs> for a baby at that one stage. I was forever running up and down to reception. And it was people that I would never have met, never have met. Wouldn't have even known, like some of the girls I wouldn't have even known, but every single one of them. And as I say, it must have been grannies and granddads and uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters all left in something for him. Come Christmas then, the, the social, the place, the room we were in there, the TV room, was absolutely chock-a-block with presents for him, for Kevin. So it was so. And again, you come down to your visiting room and mightn't even be your own visitors, they'd be all sitting talking to Kevin, you know, either they seem to make a big deal of him because he was in here. No, they did. Yeah, I think it was the 15th of November, I think I was out. Um, Daddy came up. He said I'd been out in parole a couple of times, so it wasn't so bad, you know what I mean? It was, that stage I was going out in parole and come back in again. And uh, as I say, the screws betted on whether I'd come back or not. Like, but when I came back, it was for the rest of the people that was in here and for anybody that might come behind me. And uh, it was kind of, you were getting out and leaving the wing again was very hard, leaving the girls behind you, more so than anything else. I mean, at the end of the day, you leave a part of yourself here, no matter how long you're out. The friends and the, the, the feelings you have for people in here would never, ever, you'd never have it for anybody on the outside. So you wouldn't, the connection, connections all over, like, you know, just, Walking out the wing and, and the girls shouting, don't look back. It used to be bad luck. It used to say you didn't look back on the wing when you were going away from it. Because it meant you'd be back again. And you had half a dozen one something shouting behind you, don't look back, good luck, you know, all this. And it, it was sad. It was sad leaving. I know it's stupid, but it was sad leaving because you knew you were leaving them behind you. And it was a different world then. It was... You never have the same friends. Like, you never, you'd never connect with people the same way as you do in here. And that's what I'm saying, I think a wee bit stays here. There's a friendship with me and Mary McColgan. I met her there the first time in, what, 20 years? It was like talking to her yesterday, you know? I'm gonna have to make sure and get her number and all before we leave, but I wouldn't have kept in contact with any of the girls after I left here. So, would have been kind of isolated in that way. Plenty of ex-prisoners up where I come from, all right, but most of them are men. But the connection, the connection of people in here, you leave a wee part behind you, like at the end of the day, you do leave something here. Oh, you do. Leaving, leaving is, it's not easy. No, it's not. It's the day you look forward to when you're here. <laughs> you think it's never going to come, but when it comes, there's a sadness to it too, because you're, you're leaving a lot of people behind you. So you are. People you care about, make connections with. And then the, that door, there used to be a door in there then. That's it. That used to lead into. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's part of it knocked down or what, but used to lead into reception area. Because you never seen, I mean, you get out of the farm here and you were took in there where you were. And there was a reception area and then there was screws. And there was, was a shower area or a bath. There was a shower area. And that's where your strip searches and all would happen too when you were coming in and out in parole. You were took in and strip searched in a, in a part, I think it must be knocked down because I don't recognise it, I don't recognise it when I was in that side. No, I don't. Again, on the strip search, it's like you were, you were, um, you turned it round. There's that, that blocked up, so maybe it was something there, some stage. You turned it round, you took the embarrassment off the situation and kind of gave you something to put round you, you know, when you were taking your clothes off and and um, basically, it's no good. <laughs> so you kind of, you get cheeky about it. You kind of just stripped off and stood there and went, right, there you go. Again, it was your control, your part of your control, instead of standing and being embarrassed about it. One of the worst times now would have been the hunger strikers in here because when the hunger strike was on, and any of the boys in the hunger strike or that died, you would um, lock yourself again in your cell, you'll come out, you'll watch the news and you go back into your cell till the fun after the funeral, the day after the funeral. And you've done that through every, every one of the boys that died in hunger strike. 
And then when the girls in here, a couple of the girls in here, Marie Farrell and I think it was Mary Doyle, sure, went on hunger strike. You um, there was an eerie quietness about it. You didn't want to laugh or joke or, you know, it was just an old, horrible old feeling around it. Well, there was, but locking yourself in your shell was the only way that we could show respect because there was nothing we could do. Nothing. Well, it wasn't. Um, one of the best times to be on here, mind you, was the time that the boys escaped from Long Cash. It was brilliant. There was an atmosphere in here at that time. It was fantastic. The only thing missing was the drink. <laughs> but I don't think we needed it. We were on a high. It was great. We were all locked up when it came through in the news. I think everybody, everybody rattled stuff and it was just a a great feeling you come back out on at the wing. Yeah, I'm really sure that was a hospital wing. Because uh, I think the first week or so after Kevin was born, instead of me being brought down to the, the boxes, the visitors were brought up and I could see them through one of these windies. That was a hospital wing. That was. Mm -hmm. Have a wee break and a cup of tea.